you see. Thank you. This morning, believe it or not, we are wrapping up our Sermon on the Mount, the series, His Kingdom Come. Again, we encourage you to point people towards the next sermon series that will be coming up on April 1st. That is not a joke. That's really happening. And uh, up until April 1st, uh, we will still have services, even though there won't be an active sermon series, uh, there will be sermons provided, all right? So we just, we just want to make it clear that, uh, but we are excited about the next sermon series, because the next sermon series is calling us to live out what we are learning right now. It's calling us to live out what we're learning in such a way that's very dynamic, very powerful. In essence, what we are learning is a foundation would you say that word with me this morning? Foundation. We'll say it one more time. I, I caught you off guard. I didn't give you the word first, so here we go. Say the word foundation with me this morning. Foundation. And you know, the Bible actually has a lot to say about this idea or this concept of foundations. In fact, we look to uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25, and we read this. When the storms of life come... The wicked are whirled away, but the godly, praise the Lord, listen to this, have what? A lasting foundation. Aren't you thankful for that this morning? Amen? Well, then the prophets would turn to pointing toward, towards the time of the Messiah. And even the prophets were talking about the fact that this Messiah, this coming one, that you and I know to be Jesus, our Lord, uh, he is going to be talked about as a, guess what, the word is here, again, foundation. Because we read in the next passage out of Isaiah 28, 16, therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord says, look, I am placing a, say it with me, foundation, stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. It is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever believes need never be shaken. Praise the Lord. You know, there was probably no better illustration about this idea of foundation or anchorage or uh, a being uh, really grounded than when I was ministering as lead pastor of Oakdale Family Church of the Nazarene in Oakdale, California. And if you're not familiar with the Central Valley of California, there are a lot of Almond trees, not only almond trees, there are nut trees everywhere. There are nuts everywhere. There are also the fruit nuts everywhere. Um, there are, uh, some people caught that, some people whatever, okay. So, but they, there are harvests everywhere. There are crops everywhere. And what's interesting is one day I was driving along and I noticed a crop that had something very unique. And, and I'd never seen this before because you know, yes, I was born in California, but, uh, you know, God had placed us in the Midwest when my dad was a pastor. So I grew up in the Midwest, and, and so I'd not seen this before. It almost seems as if there's a completely different tree at the trunk of this walnut tree than at the top of the walnut tree. Now, you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? Well, this is very important. This is called grafting. Anyone ever heard of that? And the purpose for this, according to UC Davis, who has one of the biggest agricultural programs in the nation, they say that it's for good anchorage. And they say that good anchorage is especially important with young trees growing in areas with high winds. Anchorage is generally best in root stocks. That's what that bottom part is called. It's called a root stock. In the spring of 2001, a root stock trial conducted by former Kern County Farmer Advisor Mario Viveros, was subjected to a fierce Santa Ana windstorm where winds blew more than 75 miles per hour for five hours. In this windstorm, 58% of the non-grafted trees blew over. In contrast, only... 4% of the grafted trees were lost. 
Interestingly enough that the studies don't stop there. It's not just about having a strong foundation and a firm foundation. In fact, when you graft a different type of walnut tree to, a, to another type of walnut tree, which is what you're looking at right now, that the bottom species of walnut tree, if you will, is stronger in its roots and also in its production of, guess what? Walnuts, fruits, and so they graft it in because it's the foundation that matters. It's the foundation that matters. Friends, this is like our relationship with God. We have heard everything from Matthew 5 at the very beginning of the Beatitudes to where we are now in Matthew chapter 7. And we've heard the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus in these teachings is saying to us, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. This is what it looks like for God to reign in your hearts and to reign among you in community. This is the kingdom of God. But friends, let's be clear. You and I, we are nothing if we just listen to this word and don't do what it says. See, Jesus' teachings were meant to be acted out. Jesus' teachings were meant to be a strong foundation from which, guess what? Great fruit will grow. Well, this sounds familiar. Jesus talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? You'll know a tree by its what? Fruits. And in the passage this morning, Jesus is saying to us, there is no other foundation. There's absolutely no other foundation that the church must root itself into, must graft itself into, that you as an individual must graft yourselves into. There is no other foundation like the foundation of Jesus Christ. That Jesus will spring forth from Jesus, will spring forth life, it will spring forth transformation, it will spring forth hope, it will spring forth love, all of these things that this community, that your world, that your families, that your life needs. You see, Jesus is the answer. Likewise, this is our relationship with Jesus. You and I must listen to what Jesus says, but then to do what it says is planting ourselves in a strong foundation that regardless of whether or not the winds and the waves and the persecution and anything else comes our way, 75 mile per hour Santa Ana winds for five hours are nothing if we are rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ, our Lord. This morning, I would ask that you would stand with me as we read from that holy passage out of Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. Grace Point Nazarene, children of God, this is the holy and the inspired word of God. Amen? Amen. It is for the people of God and for the sake of Albany and its surrounding community. And so it reads. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it, is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come, and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. With a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for your precious word. It is life to us this morning, God. Breathe into us the breath of life 
So we, as your children, would be transformed into your image for the sake of your glory so that when we leave this building, the church would then be active in sharing the love, the hope, the, the, the joy of knowing Jesus Christ. And so God, equip your church this morning. Lord, this is, in essence, the joy that a pastor gets much like walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, like John 21, where Peter and Jesus just talk, and Jesus says, feed my sheep. God, this morning, that's all I want. Lord, feed your sheep. Holy Spirit, come feed your sheep. Edify your bride. It's in the name of Jesus the church agreed and said this morning. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Uh, contrary to what I look like, I did play football in high school. Um, I actually played outside linebacker. I was good at it. I was uh, fast, but not so fast that I was a cornerback. But they had to be creative and put me in a position. And so I knew very quickly that at 5'8", I had to work out. Okay, I had to work out like no one's business, and I did. And I remember being a part of a, a, a workout program. And in this workout program, uh, we had this coach who, uh, his name was Clo uh, Coach Klopp. You know, that, that's just, and he was the lineman coach. I mean, he was just, he always had this scowl, you know, this look, and he always talked out of the side of his mouth. And it was always this story about him, like, you know, did you know that Coach Klopp used to be in the NFL, but then in the first season, he blew his knee out and then had to not play in the NFL? Isn't that crazy? We, none of us know if that story's true. But, you know, it was a story. But anyway, Coach Klopp, he had so many things that he would say, like little iconic statements. And I remember one time in the weight room, he said this statement. He said, you, you can't shoot a cannon from a rowboat. <laughs> and we all just stopped working out. I remember that the gym got really quiet. And we all just kind of looked at Coach Klopp like, did someone drop a weight on Coach's head? You know, like. We're, we're, we're kind of wondering, what are you talking about, coach? And he says it again really loud. He's like, you can't shoot a cannon from a rowboat. And we're like, okay, uh, Captain Crunch, teach us. What are you talking about? All right, so he comes on over, and he's like, you know, he's telling us, you, don't, you guys don't understand. You're working on your upper body so your chest will look good, and your biceps will look good, and, you know, your triceps, will, your shoulders will look big. And he says, but you're absolutely nothing on the field if your legs can't push its weight with everything else. And we thought about that for a second. And, and a few of us took that to heart. And a few of us really listened to coach and, and we started working on our legs. Believe it or not, that's when we really started to become bigger on top. And we understood what a coach was saying. He was saying this. You can't shoot a cannon from a rowboat. I mean, I don't know if you know this. I spent five years active duty in the Navy. This is an actual picture of me in the Navy right here. Um, I'll let you guess which one I am. Um, but no, this is ri ridiculous. I mean, that's what it would look like, and it's nonsense. And that's basically what Coach was saying. You can't do anything without a strong foundation. You can't be anything without a strong foundation. You can't be the Christian God has called you to be without a strong foundation. You can't be a servant of the Most High without a strong foundation. You can't be the church that's Christ-centered, spirit-led, faith-driven without, without having a strong what? Foundation. You know, constructural engineers... Company owners, CEOs, in fact, marriage counselors, every one of them will tell you in any profession, the thing that matters most is what? A good foundation. Think about that statement for a second. Construction workers, con construction engineers, they know good foundation makes sense. Company owners, CEOs, they know. Good foundation, makes sense, building a business. Guess what? Marriage counselors know good foundations, makes for good marriages. 
So foundations, it's all about the foundation. Why? Because from the foundation, everything else comes. It's the beginning point from the foundation. You cannot build unless you have a foundation. Someone say amen this morning. You cannot build unless you have a foundation. Because from this beginning point comes the capability of doing everything else. Going back to the picture of the tree real quick, we understand that when we are put into a a strong trunk, a strong foundation, then we can withstand turmoil and hardships and, and, and all of these things that try to steer us away from God, we can endure those because we have a faith that is grounded in nothing else than Jesus Christ our Lord. But even beyond that, because the same spirit that is in Jesus is in us, then guess what? From that, and this is what that John 15 passage was all about last Sunday, you know, remain in me and I will remain in you. Apart from me, you could do nothing. But in me, you will produce much fruit, right? That's what Jesus is talking about. That image, that's you. And being grounded in a strong foundation says, hey, guess what? You want to be positive for the kingdom? You want to make a difference in your world? You want to do something that finally matters? Be rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. I'll say it again. Be rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. Jesus cares about this so much. As he looks at each one of us, I believe with all my heart, he, he, his focus is verse 25 out of Matthew 7 that we read. And, and here's what it says. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise, it's not a matter of if the rain comes. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, though the rain comes, comes in torrents and floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house it what it won't collapse say that phrase with me it won't collapse say it one more time church it won't collapse why because it is built on bedrock and jesus has himself in mind when he says that and he's thinking about you and he's thinking about me what what does this mean though What does it look like for you and I to really make all of these teachings that we've learned about over the last seven weeks into this eighth week, to make all of these things active, a part of who we are? What does that really look like to be a part of the kingdom of God, to engage and to see amazing kingdom things happen because you're grounded and rooted in a kingdom Jesus, right? And so when we're seeing all these things happen, we're wondering, what does that look like? You know, what does that feel like? I love this commentary passage from John Gill. Now, I, I, I want you to know John Gill uh, <clears throat> lived many years ago, theologian, biblical scholar. I don't want you to miss out on the power of this statement that he writes regarding this passage in Matthew 7. Here's what he says regarding this passage about Jesus talking about building your house on the solid rock and not on the sand. He says this, every believer is a builder The house he builds is his own soul and the salvation of it, in order to which he digs deep till he comes to a rock, a good foundation. He searches diligently into the scriptures of truth. He constantly attends the ministry of the word. He inquires of the gospel preachers and other saints the way of salvation, which having found, he lays the whole stress of his salvation on the rock of ages, which rock is is Christ. He makes him the foundation of all his hopes of eternal life and happiness. This foundation, the person, blood, and righteousness of Christ is a rock, firm and strong, will bear the whole weight that is laid upon it. It is sure and certain. It will never give way. It is immovable and everlasting. The house built upon it Stand safe and sure. Isn't that good news this morning? Amen? And that could be you. And God wants that to be you. And that, God wants that to be me. God wants that to be us. He wants us to be kingdom citizens. 
And so it's not just so much knowing about Jesus, not just so much, you know, hearing. It's, it's being. It's letting the Holy Spirit have his way so that more and more your life starts looking like the kingdom of God that you're reading about in Ma- Matthew 5 through 7. You're starting to see the Holy Spirit through grace and his love for you start forming you back into the image of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I mean, this, is, this, this transformation moment is happening right now in you. It's a grace of God right now in you. And it's actually the work of the kingdom taking place right now in you. We say his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I, I love doing this and I encourage you to do it. That's not because I'm trying to be pious or anything else. This is for my own sake. This is for my own sake, what I'm sharing with you, Okay. When we say that part together, every Sunday we pray that prayer. It's a beautiful prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. And it makes so much sense that that's like the first part of it, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God, you are so holy. You are so awesome. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know what I do on that part? I, I, do, I say on earth as it is in heaven. I always point to my heart when I say on earth. Because that's what Jesus is talking about. Not talking about some hypothetical kingdom. It's happening. It's now. It's here. It's in you and me. And it's in this church. It's in the world. He's doing a work. God is at work. As we take a moment to reflect on these powerful teachings of Jesus. And as we look to the scriptures. Jesus is basically saying to us, you know, what are, what are the rain and the wind and the, and the floodwaters? It's anything attempting to take you away from Jesus. Anything attempting uh, to take you away from the, uh, the, the narrow path and, and trying to deter you and distract you. Anything. Those are the winds and those are the waves. And, but where if we're rooted and we're grounded in Christ, we look at those things and we say, hey, that's nothing. I have Jesus. I'm a kingdom citizen. This Sermon on the Mount. Let us consider for a moment these powerful teachings that we have heard from Jesus Christ our Lord over the last five or over the last seven weeks as we consider Matthew 5 through 7. I want you to picture that day. People know that Jesus is in the area, and in fact, he's attracting a bunch of people because he's healing, and, and people are seeing it, and it's amazing, and we're watching this thing unfold, and, and it's phenomenal, and, and you and I are gathering around Jesus. We're, we're gathering, and we're, we're celebrating what we're hearing because he's teaching with authority. I mean, it's not like anything you and I have ever heard, and he's talking about heaven, and, and you and I are like, man, I want to know what it takes to get to heaven, and then he starts teaching. He starts teaching. And he says, you want to know what's on God's heart? You want to know what this is really all about? Let me share with you. Matthew 5, verse 9. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. Matthew 5, 43 through 45. You've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, and that way you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. Matthew 6, 14. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth and moths eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there de- the desires of your heart will also be. Matthew six thirty three. Seek the kingdom of God 
above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Matthew 7, 5. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Matthew 7, 7. Keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. Matthew 7, 13 through 14. You can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad and the, its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow and the road is difficult and only a few ever find it. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will answer. You and I have just heard some phrases, some powerful phrases from Jesus our Lord. And the point being is, you and I could either look at those and say, well, those are just neat phrases. Those are just neat sayings. Or we could say, Jesus, I need you so that my life looks like that. So that my life looks like that. I don't want to just hear about the kingdom. I want to be a part of the kingdom. Grace Point, I don't know about you, but I feel like we're on the verge of something big. I feel like we're already seeing it. And I feel like God wants us to respond. And so this morning, I'm going to invite you to stand. And I want to share with you a concept of a lighthouse. Because maybe this morning God is asking you to respond as we sing together. To respond by coming forward and kneeling at these altars. And my prayer and my hope is that then others would come and surround and, and lay hands and just pray with them. We could just have a time of prayer because, friends, we need to respond. Again, Jesus said, this means nothing unless we do it unless we ground ourselves in it unless we are a church that is grafted into jesus rooted and grounded in love unless you and i are that we can do nothing i'm telling you right now grace point nazarene jesus wants you to be a lighthouse what i love about lighthouses is that you know where they are built they're built on what you think they're built on sand no they're built on a rock. Why? Because they need to stand the test of time. They, though they're hit by waves, though the, the rain torrents and, and the winds you know, howl and, and all of this happens, the lighthouse stands firm and it sends a message through its light. It displays and it sends a message. And what is that message? There's hope. Here's land. Watch out. There's rocks and cliffs and bluffs. Be careful. Let me shine a light in the darkness to show you the way. Friends, that's God's intention for you and me. God wants you to be a lighthouse. But that lighthouse will never stand unless it has a strong what? Foundation. Praise the Lord. As we sing, if Jesus is speaking to you, let us be spirit-led. And if you would like to come and kneel and respond, praise the Lord. We're just going to give this a few moments as we sing. Again, be obedient to God. As he speaks to your heart, listen and respond to that grace that he wants to give you this very morning. In Jesus' name.